Thanks for tuning in to Ancient Greece Declassified. Episode 5 Democracy and Demagogues in Ancient Athens. If you're listening to this podcast, then you probably live in a country that calls itself a democracy. The idea of democracy has found so much support across the world in recent decades that some political thinkers have argued that eventually the whole world will adopt Western liberal democracy. Not everyone shares their confidence about this, but most political thinkers do seem to agree on a weaker claim, namely that given the choice between democracy and autocracy, where one person rules absolutely, most people will choose democracy. In other words, the desire for democracy is now considered normal. But this way of thinking is historically abnormal. For most of history, the majority of people, including the most educated of them, did not see democracy as something desirable. They saw it either as irrelevant to their situation, a mere historical curiosity, or as downright negative, a recipe for mob rule. As our guest today, Josiah Ober, writes in his most recent book called The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece, quote, Democracy and growth define the normal conditions of modernity. Autocracy, while still prevalent, is regarded as aberrant, so that most autocrats pretend to be democrats. These conditions were not normal or even imaginable for most people through most of human history. But for several centuries, in the first millennium BCE, democracy and growth were normal for citizens in ancient Greece. How that happened and why it matters is what this book is about." End quote. Ober points out that there were also a few other brief moments in history where some degree of democratic self-governance appeared, for example in the Italian city-states during the Renaissance and in the Dutch republics of the 16th century. All of these self-governing societies saw great economic and cultural efflorescence, but they also didn't last more than a few centuries, and after their demise, it took hundreds, or in the case of ancient Greece, thousands of years for democracy to re-emerge as an attractive proposition. At 240 years old, the United States is one of the longest-lasting constitutional republics in history. And so, one may wonder, are we living in another of these rare historical bubbles? in which democracy and economic progress seem to lead the way into the future? Or have we finally reached an enlightened point of no return, so that even if disaster should strike, like a zombie apocalypse, survivors would reorganize themselves into new democracies? Or have we achieved a fundamentally new type of democracy that is essentially different from previous democratic experiments, and thus not beset by the same problems and dangers that older democratic societies faced? Ober suggests that the ancient Greek world was historically exceptional in many of the same ways that our modern world is, and thus, quote, we have strong reasons to want to know whether Greece's doom must also be our own. And if not, why not? End quote. Now, what the future holds in store for democracy, and whether or not earlier democratic experiments have anything to tell us about the present state of affairs, these are obviously difficult questions to answer, and different historians have very different approaches to these issues. But one question most of them try to answer is, how did democracy become normal in the Greek world by the 5th century BC? And the answers to this question have changed dramatically over the past few decades, thanks in part to new evidence and new analytical tools and the use of computers. Ober's latest book, The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece, represents one of the more recent attempts to bring together archaeological data, economic theory, and historical and demographic models in order to explain the political developments of the classical Greek world. Josiah Ober is professor of political science and classics at Stanford University. He joins us now to discuss ancient Athens, how the Athenian system compared to our own democracy, and what lessons, if any, we can take away from the Athenian experience. <laughs> 
Josiah Ober, welcome to Ancient Greece Declassified. Thank you. The claim is often repeated that Athens was the first democracy. But did the Athenians ever make that claim? And is it possible that there had been earlier states that displayed prominent democratic structures? This really depends on how we define democracy. In many ways, very early pre-agricultural foraging communities, say 11,000 years ago, uh, most of those communities, maybe all of those communities, probably had the feature of being roughly democratic in that they were self-governing. They weren't under the command of some king or some absolute ruler. What is certainly the case is the Athenians invented the word democracy, demokratia, and they worked out the, a really sophisticated version of large-scale collective self-governance by a very large number of people um, with the kind of institutional structure that we can study. Whether there were other such structures in Phoenicia, in the city-states of early Sumer, we don't know because we simply don't have the evidence for those. Now, we moderners today associate democracy with voting. We think that voting is the quintessential democratic act, but voting actually was not a cornerstone of Athenian democracy. So what was their way of choosing officials? In Athens, voting is used to choose some officials. For example, the 10 generals each year. But many officials are chosen by lottery. So I think that we should be looking at the way in which the lottery allows ordinary citizens to participate quite intensely in their collective self-governance, because the lottery didn't require an individual to be famous, didn't require him even to be particularly competent, it just required that he was a citizen in good standing who was willing to put his name in the hat, as it were, and to serve then for a year, and then to face the formal accountability procedure that came after the year's service. So you had to volunteer to put, get your name in the lottery. It wasn't like every citizen was entered. So this is a question, and unfortunately, we don't know really the answer to that question. Um, uh, we do know that a very large percentage of total Athenian citizens who reached age 30 spent a year serving as a member of the Council of 500, which is a hugely important position. How do we know that? most Athenians would have been counselors. You can work this out demographically, but the way I like to think about it is that we know for sure that Socrates spent a year on the council. Now, Socrates wasn't particularly interested in the kind of day-to-day -day politics that the Athenians tend to associate with democratic self-government, and yet Socrates was on the council. So. I can't imagine that Socrates eagerly put his name in that hat. Um, on the other hand, we have no evidence to believe that people were forced to put their name in the hat. My tendency is to think that it is an expectation of a citizen that at some point in your life, you will in fact put your name in the hat. And Socrates was a good citizen, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Okay, so. Voting was not the way that most officials were elected, except for the generals, but it was very important in the public assembly where foreign policy decisions were made. Today, in the U.S., Congress has the power to declare war, and the president can do some military operations without a formal declaration of war. But in ancient Athens, acts of war had to be voted by the entire citizen assembly. Is that correct? Yes. Pretty much all important state business has to be voted by the citizen assembly. The assembly met, at least in the time of Plato and Aristotle, uh, 40 times each year, and av average attendance seems to have been between six and 8,000. So a lot of citizens gathering together, making a judgment on the most important things. Herodotus famously said in his histories, that it wasn't until the Athenians established democracy that they became a great power. 
he suggests that democracy was conducive to both economic and military strength. On the other hand, archaeological evidence and some other historical studies seem to show that there was already a trend towards increasing economic development in Athens leading up to the establishment of democracy. So was it democracy that boosted the Athenian economy, or was it perhaps the already increasing prosperity that enabled and facilitated the establishment of democracy? Right. So I think that probably in order to really answer that question, we need to back up a little bit. So democracy, I think, as the Athenians understood it, was a very strong version of a more general kind of citizen-centered social organization that we see in the Greek world beginning probably with the end of the so-called Dark Age um, in the 8th century BCE. What appears to be the case is that a number of emergent communities at that point reject the idea that one individual should be dominant and embrace the idea that some substantial percentage of the adult male residents of a given territory ought to be in charge of public affairs. And so I think that that's really the feature that tends to really push prosperity in the Greek world generally um, is this move towards a citizen-centered form of government. Now, we can talk about why that might be. But Athens, I think, was on that trend line. Um, I think the Athenian democracy is a very sort of intense version of this broad citizen-centered form of government. And it's really an intensification of a process that was enabling economic growth already and just simply intensifies that trend that's already in place. Scholars used to think up until recently that ancient Greece was a resource poor and even economically poor area compared to the more wealthy societies in the East. But now you and some of your colleagues are challenging this picture. In fact, one of the chapters in your recent book is called Wealthy Hellas. So what are some of the new methods and tools that you and others employ to redraw the economic landscape of ancient Greece and Athens in particular? Yeah, so when I was growing up as a graduate student back in the 1970s, it was just taken for granted that the Greek world was relatively poor and had a very low level of economic development. In fact, probably saw no substantial development from the time of Homer to the time of Aristotle. Uh, and so we just pretty much accepted that. That's That seemed plausible enough. Um, but there's been a great deal of archaeology that's been done since the 1970s. And then there's also been a lot of work on really specifying what we know about all of the very large number of city-states in the Greek world. And that has all been gathered together in a big inventory by a Danish team fairly recently. So the upshot was there's a lot of new information that allowed for much more precise demographic measurements. And as it turns out, the total population of the Greek world was growing really dramatically. I mean, you simply can't make any plausible claim that in the age of Homer and in the age of Aristotle, the populations of the Greek world were roughly similar. The population of the Greek world in the time of Aristotle was vastly higher than that of, uh, I mean, by a fact order of magnitude, 10 times higher. And meanwhile, the archaeological evidence was making it increasingly clear that not only were there many more Greeks, but the gr average Greek or the median Greek was consuming considerably more than they had been in the time of Homer. So it's not only a matter of the kind of extensive growth that economists talk about, which can be measured by population, but they're also intensive or per capita growth so that each individual is actually doing better, has more potential for consumption. So uh, it was really a growing body of empirical evidence that by the time I wrote this book on the rise and fall of classical Greece, 
uh, was just, you know, it was no, no longer reasonable to say that the Greek world didn't experience growth. Um, uh, it was really then a matter of explaining why the Greek world experienced the rather dramatic economic growth that it quite evidently did. One thing that makes ancient Greek history so interesting is precisely this uh, rapid rate of development. From 900 BC to, say, 200 BC, in the space of 700 years, the Greeks go from being illiterate pastoralists to city-dwelling people making all kinds of machines, astronomical instruments, and uh, even proto-steam engines. Now, you talk about the ecology of the Greek world, comprised of over a thousand independent city-states. And you use this metaphor, borrowed from Plato, of ants around a pond. So how does this metaphor of Greeks being like ants around the Mediterranean pond, how does that help us understand the vibrant economic activity in the Greek world? So it's certainly true. Plato and other Greek intellectuals recognized that the Greeks inhabited a very distinctive part of the world, um, and that is they tended to really cluster around the shores of the Mediterranean and to some extent the shores of the Black Sea. So that's the pond that they're clustering around. And furthermore, they tended to cluster in um, uh, urban centers. So I think ants live in nests, you know, all sort of living intensely together. And I think that's one reason that Plato liked that, that metaphor. Um, one thing that's really striking about the Greek occupation of the Mediterranean coastal zone is the level of urbanization. So by the time of Aristotle, once again, it looks as if roughly a third of all Greeks are living in cities or towns of 5,000 people or more. Now, we might think, wow, a town of 5,000 people doesn't seem like a city to me. But when you look at any kind of historical demography, the Greek world was remarkably urbanized, uh, vastly more urbanized than the whole of the Roman Empire. If you look at the Roman Empire at its height, um, even more substantially urbanized than early modern Europe. Uh, the rate of urbanization in the United Kingdom doesn't equal that of the Greek world until the turn of the 19th century. So we think this is one of the key things, is that urbanization is traditionally, by people who look at the history of economic development, traditionally closely associated with economic growth. And so one of the questions we have to ask is, how is it that the Greeks are able to do this? How is it that they cluster together in these urban centers that allows for the kind of exchange of information, the kind of uh, development of the right kind of social networks that tends to foster economic growth over time? For the Greeks in the 5th century BC, the wealth of Persia was unimaginably vast. Historians used to be hesitant to use the term middle class for ancient societies, but you use the term in your book. So how would the, say, middle class Athenian compare in economic prosperity and consumption with the average resident in a Persian city at the time? So unfortunately, we just don't have much archaeological evidence for the way in which ordinary Persians are living. So perhaps they're living much better than I imagine. What we can say is what was an average Athenian, or by extrapolation, an average Greek living. Um, uh, and it is really quite remarkably high level when you compare that to the level of the most highly developed societies of early modern Europe, that is at the level of um, Holland in the 16th or 17th century. That's the level that the Athenians were living at, or that a middling Athenian was living at. So until there's some good reason to think that other ancient societies are at the level of 17th century Holland, um, I think there's reason to think that the middling Athenian is in fact living a lot better than the 
middling residents of various other ancient communities, ancient societies, ancient empires. Um, we can do some direct comparison with Rome because there have been estimates of the level of the middling uh, a Roman and clearly the middling Athenian is doing better than the generic middling Roman if you take the middling Roman at the time of the of the high empire. So I think that it's more likely that the average Persian was living closer to the level of the middling Roman than closer to the level of the middling Athenian. Wow, that's fascinating that the economic level of the middling Roman citizen hundreds of years later in a much more technologically advanced society was not up to the same level that Athens achieved. Right, and we have to be careful here because we're the, the ways that Rome has been modeled, it's really for the whole of the Roman Empire. So it may well be that parts of the Roman Empire did in fact see levels of, as it were, middling Roman consumption that would have been equal to that of Athens. So perhaps if you're living in the more uh, developed parts of Italy, um, if you were living in Pompeii, for example, very likely you were doing really quite well, even if you're kind of a middling Pompeian. But across the whole empire, it's pretty clear that the average Roman was, was consuming at a substantially lower level. Now, of course, there were also slaves in Athens, and we know of some slaves that were remarkably wealthy, and we also know of slaves working in the silver mines of Laurion who were working in absolutely horrendous conditions. So can we say anything about the average economic situation of a slave in Athens? So it's very hard to sort out the slave population from the rest of the population. Um, uh, we have no idea how many slaves there were in ancient Athens, and that's because the Athenians never had any idea how many slaves there were in ancient Athens. They had no reason to count them. What I've tried to do is to come up with some kind of a model of Athenian the whole Athenian population, which takes as its beginning point guesses about the number of slaves that are within range of what is sort of the normal range of guesses that are uh, made by other ancient historians. And so when I say that the median Athenian, the person in the middle of this distribution, um, uh, was doing remarkably well compared to what we can extrapolate of other ancient societies. That includes the entire slave population. But it's important to remember that that's the median person and that the people at the very bottom of the distribution, the people who were um, doing worst, were probably living lives that were very miserable. There are places in Plato's dialogues, which take place in Athens, of course, where some of the characters will ask a slave to read to them. So do we know anything about literacy rates across the population of both citizens and slaves? So literacy has been one of these really difficult problems that classicists have worried about for a long time. The conventional assumption is that literacy must be pretty low across the entire population because Athens is a pre-modern society and pre-modern societies typically have relatively low literacy rates. Now, the most advanced pre-modern European societies, the ones that Athens appears to track in terms of its consumption rates of you know, what the median citizen was consuming, those European societies like Holland in the 16th and 17th century have much higher literacy rates than the background pre-modern society. And so the question is, do Athenian literacy rates come up to those higher Dutch 17th century rates or not. And we don't know. Um, although I think it's plausible that they do. Uh, we've got ever more information for casual writing in the Greek world. Um, uh, there's been a lot of study recently on graffiti. Uh, we've got graffiti that looks to be graffiti by just ordinary people. Um, uh, shepherds and goat herds. And if shepherds and goat herds were able to at least scratch their name on a rock in the middle of southern Attica, it is at least plausible that there is something like semi-literacy 
capacity to at least write and recognize your own name and maybe some, some uh, sound out words uh, is quite general across the population. Now, how deeply that extends into the slave population is even harder to say. Um, uh, but I think that given what we now think we know about the general level of prosperity in Athens, the literacy rates in this prosperous, highly urbanized world might in fact be much higher than have been assumed by classicists on the basis that the Greek world was just sort of a garden variety early modern community. Women were not included in the assemblies and they were not, they did not hold office and moderners often dismiss the notion that Athens qualifies as a real democracy because only citizen males could hold office. On the other hand, there are respects in which some scholars have pointed out that Athens was quite a radical democracy compared to our own modern democratic states. So if an ancient Athenian were to see our government today, would he think it's a democracy? Well, I think one way to think about how we define citizenship and um, relate citizenship to democracy um, is to ask, is it the case in your community that everyone who is culturally imaginable as a citizen actually has participation rights in the community? And the Athenians could say, pretty close. Then we would say, well, but how about women? Because of course, women are culturally imaginable as full citizens to us. The Athenians would say they're not culturally imaginable. Oh, sure, we can have fantasies. You can go watch Aristophanes, but it's not. It's it's, it's a fantasy. It's not. It's not. We, we, nobody in the Greek world, they would say, ever imagined that women should participate in the civic assemblies or in the courtrooms, so on, um, should hold office. Uh, so then the question is, well, the Athenian would come back, and how about you guys? Um, is everybody uh, in your modern state uh, uh, who is culturally imaginable to you as a citizen actually a participatory citizen? And I think we'd have a harder time answering that. We would say, well, of course, yes, native-born women are, and so we include them. Um, but of course, we regard immigrants as culturally imaginable as citizens, long-term residents who have been here, who have established um, uh, uh, themselves, uh, are they all citizens? Well, they're not all citizens. Um, uh, and the Athenian would then say, well, why aren't they? And we might have a discussion about that. So Athens, like most pre-modern societies, did not include women in their political sphere. But even though we find some aspects of Athenian democracy morally questionable compared to our modern values, are there enough structural similarities between our system and theirs that make studying these earlier forms of democracy useful in understanding democracy as a system? Yeah, I, I think there is. Um, uh, I mean, of course for us it's simply silly to say that women can't be citizens. Of course, it wasn't regarded as silly as recently as 100 years ago. Um, uh, the whole uh, women's suffrage movement had to make an argument that women ought to be citizens. They wouldn't simply be um, reduplicating the votes of their husbands. This was actually an equality argument that used to be made, that this was going to disadvantage unmarried men because every married man would have two votes because his wife would simply vote the way he told her to. Uh, and women had to make the argument that that's not not the case that each individual woman was going to be voting her own conscience, not just simply under the control of her husband. So it's taken us a long time uh, to come to the point in which it simply would be unimaginable for someone to say, let's um, uh, get rid of the 19th Amendment and have women not have the vote. But uh, so the question really is then, um, is there anything to learn from a society that simply has a different assumption about who ought to be included in the body of the citizens? Uh, and I think there is, 
if and only if we assume that the core theoretical question um, is how do you take a large socially diverse body of people and bring them together into some kind of a governing role such that they, they can make plausible and beneficial uh, decisions for themselves um, uh, on a consistent enough basis to actually have a, a working government. Uh, and that's, I think, something that's really an important question and that we can study Athens and come up with some answers to that. Had they been like the Spartans and thought to simply eliminate diversity within their body of citizens, I think it wouldn't be very useful or very interesting. Now, one of the really peculiar features of ancient Athenian democracy was the institution of ostracism. What was ostracism? So, the institution of ostracism allowed the Athenian people once a year and only once a year to make a decision about whether there was one individual, one Athenian, who would be expelled from their community without a trial, without even the accusation of formal wrongdoing. They could be gathered in their citizen assembly, had a vote about whether there was reason to hold an ostracism that year. So you needed a quorum to do that. If they voted yes, which they did, we believe, about 15 times in the course of the 5th century BC, there was a second vote in which each citizen brought an ostracon, that is a shirt of pottery, to the agora inscribed with the name of the individual he thought would be most suitable for expulsion. Whoever received the plurality of the votes was expelled for 10 years. There was no criminal charge. There was no punishment for that individual's family. It didn't affect his property, but he had to be gone for 10 years. So there was no guarantee of a comfortable retirement, uh, as there is today for virtually all politicians in Western countries. If you really screwed up or did something that the demos, the people, really didn't like, uh, they could get rid of you for a period of time. So we don't know what the motivations are in each ostracism. Some of our ancient sources say that it was initially established to deal with tyranny. But what it seems to be is a general threat that is brought against the highly ambitious elite politicians who tend to be the most active members of the political class at this point. It's sort of a threat that unless you can keep your act together and not appear to be dangerous to the general background rule of the people, that we're going to pick one of you and get rid of you. So the Athenians have other ways of punishing politicians who were thought to have failed in office or had malfeasance in office. Every Athenian official had to pass a formal scrutiny in office after a year's service. So ostracism stands outside that. Uh, it's a, sort of a general threat to intervene in elite political activity by simply throwing out someone who is thought to be a general troublemaker or a general danger. And of course, you didn't know who it would be, and so it's a threat to really the entire class of very prominent politicians. One problem, or at least fear, that occupies the minds of people living in democratic societies throughout history is the demagogue. Now. There are several figures in ancient Athenian history that have come down as demagogues. Besides ostracism, what mechanisms were in place to kind of make sure that demagogues don't seize too much power and, and get things out of control? Yeah, so the question of you know, who is a demagogue and what is a demagogue is something that really bothered the ancient Athenians. The various critics of Athenian democracy believed that the Athenian democracy was systematically vulnerable to these kind of charismatic individuals, and therefore terrible mistakes are made, and some of the 
ancient critics of democracy would say this is why Athens lost the Peloponnesian War and so on, because these, these demagogues you know, uh, misled uh, the people. So there are times in which individuals who can be reasonably as identified as demagogues do in fact persuade the Athenians to make bad decisions and they pay for it. Had that simply be systematically all Athenian democracy was about, Athens wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. We've got 180 years plus of democratic history, um, and for almost all of that time, Athens was a leading, if not the leading state of the Greek world. So um, there are, in fact, ways in which demagogues or the worst tendencies of demagogues were controlled. And in some ways, that's institutional. Um, that is, they could be legally restrained for having proposed measures that were against the interests of the Athenians. And furthermore, the Athenian demos, I think, became increasingly sophisticated about what it was to make a judgment that was actually in the interests of the demos and became very suspicious about appeals that simply sounded too good to be true. The British historian Mary Beard recently wrote in an article that it's actually, if you try to set objective criteria to distinguish these famous demagogues like Cleon from these famous good guys like Pericles, it's actually surprisingly difficult to come up with a criteria that just sorts them out. So is there any lesson from the Athenian democratic experience on, let's say, how to identify a demagogue? Yeah, I think that the difference between a demagogue and a good democratic advisor of the people is the good advisor of the people is looking towards the common interest of the community on a reasonably long time horizon. So not just what's good for us this week, but what will be good for us a year from now, a generation from now, whatever it may be. Um, the demagogue, presumably, is the one who says, let's not worry about the common interests. Let's, for example, concern ourselves with the interest of a majority that I can gain at this assembly meeting right now, and let's worry about the interests of that faction, and let's not worry about long term. Let's do something that will be good for that faction in the very short run. So that would be one criterion to, to judge it by. But unfortunately, this is often, this is really, and this is maybe Mary Beard's point, that's a kind of post-eventum analysis. So Cleon, um, uh, the, the famous demagogue says in one of his famous demagogic moments, I can solve the problem of the Spartans at the moment trapped on the island of Sphacteria, and I can do it fast, and I can do it decisively. Um, and Thucydides, the historian, sort of sets out this whole scene and says, yes, he was really a bloviator, he full of boasting and so on, and yet the Athenians partly because they thought it would be really funny to um, see that this boaster could come through with it, said, all right, fine, you can be the general, go out and do it, and he did it. Brings the Spartans back, captures them without a lot of losses, um, gives the Athenians a tremendous advantage over their opponents in the middle of the war. So was he a demagogue at that point, or was he a really good politician? Well, maybe at that moment, he was a really good advisor to the people. Then he then says, OK, um, we can um, uh, sort out the situation up in the north in Amphipolis. It turns out very badly, relatively badly. Ah, I guess maybe he was a demagogue at that point. So I think that I think the, the, the core problem is, is that although we can create objective criteria, the objective type criteria don't capture um, uh, the uh, situation at the moment of the demagogic or the non-demagogic appeal. They only capture um, the long-term effect of whether um, the appeal worked out pretty well for the long-term interests of the um, community or not. It certainly is easier in hindsight. So many of the ancient historians, including Herodotus and Thucydides and much later Plutarch, uh, 
they speak of the, let's say, popular or democratic faction of every city-state, as well as the oligarchic or aristocratic faction. And there seems to be this, at least as it's portrayed in these writers, a kind of tug-of-war dynamic between the two. So is there any parallel between that and our modern liberal versus conservative or red versus blue politics? Yeah, I think that the idea of the sort of the many and the few, or the ordinary citizens and the wealthy citizens was in some ways clearer to the Greeks than red and blue is to us in terms of any kind of a demographic sorting. So the few were those who had a lot more money than other people, who had a different education than most people other people, in some cases, who could claim a special ancestry. Um, uh, if uh, you were doing this in philosophical terms, who could claim a higher level of virtuousness. At any rate, there's a set of attributes that all go together that say there are you know, a fairly small slice of society that is special, that is set out against all the rest of us. The red-blue doesn't track that very well. Um, uh, so in many ways, um, the people who are the leaders of both the red and the blue parties, um, as it were, are elites without a question. They're much richer than the rest of us. They're educated in different kinds of ways. They are um, have different experience of, of life. Um, the people who make up the sort of base of the left and right parties, red and blue parties, um, uh, have now a mix of you know, relatively affluent, middling, and you know, really struggling people. So that doesn't sort very neatly either. Um, so I think ultimately, no, um, that uh, uh, our own world of polarized political party system is really um, uh, something that's quite different from what was going on in the, in the ancient world, or in ancient Athens, anyway. As you say, the current, let's say, red versus blue political situation cuts across all social strata. So you have poor and rich people on both sides. And it would seem that in the ancient world there are clear class divisions. On the other hand, Pericles is, you know, blue blood, and yet he is championing the cause of the democratic faction. And in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, when he describes the outbreak of civil war in Corsaira between the oligarchic and democratic factions, he says that both sides immediately rushed to try to get the slaves to join their side in the fight. So if it was just a class distinction, it would be shocking if the aristocrats actually thought they could get the slaves to join their side. So is it possible that there was maybe not quite the level we see today, but that there was also a spectrum of economic levels on both sides of the dynamic? Yeah, so the that certainly is the case that the the cause of the demos um, was sponsored by individuals like Pericles who were you know, elite in their wealth and their education and, and so on. Uh, some other elites in the Greek world thought that people like Pericles were class traitors and that they were only doing this for their own advantage. We get this in the um, famous text by the so-called old oligarch who explicitly says those who are of the elite who favor um, the demos are just doing it because they're wicked, you know, so they can get away with wickedness. But clearly that's not what the tradition even of writers like Thucydides tends to think. It doesn't think Pericles was just simply an opportunist. Uh, and so the, what the Democrats would claim, um, what the uh, ancient Democrats would, would claim, um, is that the demos is all of us, right? The demos is all Athenian citizens, you know, rich and not rich in the middle, um, and that all of the citizens ought to have the same interest, ultimately, that is, the good of their community. Um, uh, it's the elites who are, or at least the elites who don't want to go along with the demos, 
who are trying to create this conception of two factions, that is the non-wealthy who are working in their own interest and the wealthy who are working in their interest. So it's in some ways asymmetric warfare, you know? I mean, the the Democrats get to claim it's all of us, uh, whereas the elites have to claim that no, the few of us do have a special right to some special standing. As you say in your book, we today think of democracy as the normal. There are many prosperous democratic states across the world, and there are many more that want to join the club of prosperous democratic states. And you know, some people even say that's the end of history. Everybody wants to be a liberal democracy and that's it. But as you also point out, this is a historical anomaly. If we zoom out, we see that there have been previous democratic moments but they haven't lasted very long. The U.S. now with a 240-year history has already outlived most of them. So should we as citizens in modern democratic states, is there anything that we should take away from this, that this is a precious political situation that we have and we must really do our part to preserve it, to maintain it? Yeah, I mean, if you want to keep a democracy in which you actually do have a real role as a citizen, I think that, yeah, it takes a lot of work. I think this is one of the real questions we have today is whether people are willing to do the work that does in fact, that will in fact uh, be required in order to sustain a society in which citizens are participants. So if we're not, we'll have some sort of autocracy. And it's really the only two choices we have. Either citizens govern themselves, you know, this basic definition of democracy is collective self-governance by citizens, or we're governed by either some elite small group or by some individual. Uh, and to pretend that democracy is this kind of freebie um, that we can just cruise along and um, put full effort into everything else we do in our lives and never really give any attention and time and effort to the work of being a citizen, we're just wrong. Um, uh, and so I think that's really the question we have for the future. Josiah Ober, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to invite our listeners to visit the website at greasepodcast.com slash five. See the link in the description. We've set up a poll so that you can vote on what you think about the future of democracy, and you can join the conversation in the comments section. Also on the website, you'll find more info on Josiah Ober's book, The Rise and Fall of Classical Greece. In the next episode, we're going to look at another major innovation that happened right around the time democracy was invented, the theater. In particular, we'll try to understand what Greek tragedy was all about in a conversation with renowned classicist, actor, and director Rush Rem. In the meantime, if you'd like to support this podcast, please rate us on iTunes. It'll take you a minute, and it will really help the project grow. And make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram with the handle at Grease Podcast to stay up to date on upcoming episodes and news. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Ancient Greece Declassified. Can you still sing Orpheus and sing something that's going to last? A thousand years slips by so fast, goes off into a dusty myth with you.